Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Live at Five. I am your curator and host, Kevin Adkison, coming to you from today, uh, one of the most enchanting little spots of Cranbrook and also one of the oldest spots on Cranbrook's campus, the Greek Theater. Uh, and so today's tour, we're going to stay in what? I don't know. Uh, 150 yards going up and down and learning all of the details that we can about this uh, little piece of the Cranbrook estate. And the Greek theater uh, completed construction in September of 1915, uh, which means that it's older than Brookside, it's older than anything uh, of the Sarnins. The Sarnins had never been to America in 1915. Uh, the Greek theater was built really as part of the private estate of George and Ellen Booth. It was not part of Cranbrook educational community, though it's become, of course, an integral a part of the Cranbrook story. And so on today's tour, we're going to look at the, the main areas of the Greek theater, uh, and then we'll hear some about the very first play that came on, uh, that was put on here by Sidney Co. Howard in 1916. And so the origins of the Greek theater, there's sort of two origins. Um, there's the story of why we have a Greek theater at all, and then there's the story of uh, from an architectural standpoint, and then from a sort of little theater movement. And it really can be traced to this uh, large pit of rocks here. Um, in 1908, the Booths had moved out from their city home on Trumbull Avenue in Detroit. And as they built Cranbrook House, which is uh, just over the pathway here, uh, was the Booth family home, they needed a water tower. And so they built their first water cistern on this high point of the hill. But the water cistern would overflow, and so it was creating a series of drainage issues. Uh, the ram's house, the pump house, was down by the M Morris Mill. They would pump the water up to the top of the hill, and instead of le letting it just run off arbitrarily, uh, about 1910, they began building the Cascades. Uh, and so the Cascades were designed by Henry Woodbooth, who was George's father. And he designed a series of pools going from this uh, sort of semicircular lunette. Uh, and then the water runs down. It runs underneath the pathway there uh, into a little lake area and then all the way down to Kingswood Lake. And so they started uh, just by thinking of how are we going to control this overflowing cistern? And then they realized, what if we stop the water before it gets to this overrun? And so they uh, constructed the, the family swimming pool up here on the hillside. And so the swimming pool uh, was here by 1914. Uh, and that's when George Booth and Ellen got back from a trip to Sicily. And while they were in Sicily, they had visited a number of different ancient uh, Greek theaters uh, and Roman theaters, I guess. And they were inspired to build a theater on the site. There were a number of different reasons why they uh, wanted a theater. Um, and chief among them was a growing interest in the city of Detroit about the little theater movement. In particular, for the booths, um, they had been inspired by uh, the performance of May Morris, William Morris's daughter, when in 1910 she put on the pageantry and the mask, which was a play uh, that she delivered at the Detroit Art Museum in 1910. Uh, it launched a whole movement in Detroit to start Little Theater. Uh, shortly after May Morris performed the pageantry and the mask, uh, George Booth bought embroidery work by her that became his bedroom hangings. Uh, but then a local playwright wrote, wrote the uh, a modern immorality play, as she called it, called Every Woman. And Every Woman was uh, uh, had such hit characters as suffrage and art. 
And shortly after that, uh, The Mask of Arcadia, which was another Detroit written play, was put on at the J.L. Hudson estate, uh, Clairview in Gross Point. And George and Ellen Booth went to Clairview to see uh, The Mask of Arcadia. And I imagine that's when George Booth not only enjoyed the play, uh, but he also thought, I want to be able to put plays on at my house at Cranbrook. And so after he had gone to Sicily in 1914, he came back and he went to his uh, preferred architect, Marcus Burroughs, who uh, was trained in the architectural firm of Albert Kahn and Associates. Uh, Burroughs was a Canadian. Uh, he lived in uh, um, uh, outside of Windsor. And he designed Tower Cottage, he designed parts of Brookside, he designed a lot of the sort of secondary buildings here at Cranbrook. And so he designed the theater uh, in 1915. Construction ended in September of that year, and it was dedicated the next June. And I just want to point a few of the key features out of the Greek theater. Um, one of those being the series of two panels, uh, which are after Della Robbia. Della Robbia was a Renaissance artist. Uh, this one is called The Drummers, and you can see the drummers there. Uh, these are made out of cast concrete, and these were made in Boston at the firm of P.P. Cabroni. Uh, and the Cabroni brothers were uh, major Italian uh, mold makers. They worked in Boston. The firm that they purchased had been around since the 1830s. Uh, but interestingly, the Caproni brothers were the last uh, great mold makers to be allowed to make cast from the original in European museums. And so these are made cast of, I believe the Uffizi Gallery has the original, uh, and then they could sell the reproductions. And plaster casts were integral to the education of young architects and artists and were uh, used in classical, neoclassical architecture all around the country. Uh, here you see the horns. So you have drummers on one side and horns on the other. And then behind the Greek theater is uh, all of the seating. George Booth originally wanted seating for 300 people. Uh, in the end, they could max out the production uh, at close to 500. I don't know what the seating is with the aluminum benches, but they would often uh, bring in more seating when they would have major shows. And the most major show that they ever had uh, here was absolutely the Cranbrook Mask. And the Cranbrook Mask was a custom piece written for the opening of the Greek theater. George Booth hired a young up-and-coming Boston playwright, Sidney Coe Howard, to compose the Cranbrook Mask. If you know the name, uh, he became the, he was the screenwriter for uh, the script of Gone with the Wind, which he won the Academy Award for in 1939. But right at the start of his career, Howard traveled through Europe and he went to all sort of ancient sites to write this four hour epic called the Cranbrook Mask. And the mask was part of the little theater movement in America, which was this sort of anti-commercialism movement. They thought the mainstream theater had sold out. And so it was a group of um, writers, authors, social workers, socialists, um, playwrights, artisans who got together and made these little theater productions. And the Detroit Society of Arts and Crafts is where Detroit's little theater was founded. And so George Booth underwrote the Cranbrook Mask as a fundraiser for the Detroit Society of Arts and Crafts. George Booth had been uh, the sort of instigator of establishing the society in 1906. He was elected as its first president, and their major fundraiser to build the Watson Street building was the Cranbrook Mask here on campus. Sam Hume was the producer. He was another Boston-based playwright. He also uh, was the lead. He was the, the lead character. And the Cranbrook Mask, you can read more about it on our website. It was a wild play. Um, first of all, it was over four hours long. And it, it took place in five acts. And the acts went from ancient Greece uh, through uh, medieval Europe to Elizabethan England 
to 17th century Italy and then modern times. Uh, and as the uh, play moved through those different time zones, uh, we followed certain characters. So in Act One in Ancient Greece, the uh, uh, main characters were Orpheus and Eurydice, which this is 20 years before the Orpheus Fountain at the Art Museum. And Orpheus and Eurydice were joined by two characters, Pan, who was the god of merriment, and Fool's Gold, who was a special character for the Cranbrook Mask, who appeared in every act, who was the sort of comic foil for this epic 32-person cast. Um, so the costumes were designed by Catherine McEwen, who you may know that name because she designed all of the frescoes at Christchurch Cranbrook and at Brookside School as well as the boys' school. So she was the costume maker and she had a, an army of seamstresses in Tower Cottage working away on the costumes, many of which we still have at Cranbrook. Uh, then the actors lived in a lodge uh, north of the lake. The female actors lived in a different lodge. It was a real production and it was especially dramatic because at the end of the ancient Greek act, uh, the god Pan emerged uh, and he comes on stage at the same time the sun is setting behind the Greek theater and up comes a score from the German composer uh, uh, Christoph Gluck from the Orphe Orpheus and Eurydice opera of 1762. So that was where the score was used, uh, or, or the score was from. It was from a number of different operas and I thought that we would enjoy hearing a little bit of the opera today. So that concluded act one of both the Cranbrook Mask and uh, our little tour here. And for act two, we'll look at some more of the details and then we'll come back and hear more from Chase. Thank you for our first piece. Um, there are other interesting details that pan as he emerged. It's hard to imagine now sunset actually setting behind the Greek theater because all these pine trees were not here yet. And so uh, you really actually could see all the way to downtown Pontiac because we are at such a high elevation. Uh, and then you could also look up and the whole thing looked like the Greek Acropolis because of these cast concrete columns. And these columns were not made for the Greek theater. These are actually recycled from the Cranbrook West uh, Terrace, which is where George Booth built the Cranbrook Library. And so uh, these were originally a pergola. They were closer together and they had a wooden pergola going across them. And when George Booth began construction on the library in 1918, he moved these columns here. They are to designs of Albert Kahn, and they're pretty interesting because they are fully round concrete castings. And in order to achieve that, uh, the architect specified that these be made in uh, essentially uh, wooden barrels, and then the concrete was poured in, and the columns were rolled until they cured fully 360 degrees. So they just kept them moving as they cured. The actor's court back here features more castings from the Cap uh, Caproni brothers. Uh, these are from the Acropolis, and these would not have been done from the Acropolis panels in the British Museum because they're not full-sized. A lovely uh, 
Greek order column here, and then a nice painted ceiling. 1916 is the moment when we're beginning to realize that ancient Greek and Roman architecture was not uh, monochromatically white, but that it was polychrome. And so you see here a sort of early um, exploration into what an old uh, Greek temple might have been with its color schemes. Uh, back here, it's used largely for storage, but this is a 1924 edition, uh, The Actor's Court, which was designed by Henry Scripps Booth, the George and Ellen's son who studied architecture with Aelio Saarinen. Uh, and the actor's court was built to increase the size of the changing rooms, uh, a lovely fountain in the center. And so the original bathhouse uh, of 19. 15 was ended here, and then the addition was the sort of fully enclosed court. And then as we come back out, we are looking at the back of Persephone. This is a sculpture by M. Marshall Fredericks, and Marshall Fredericks was a sculptor who studied with, uh, was an assistant to Carl Millis, and then taught at Kingswood School for Girls. And this sculpture, as Fredericks uh, originally sculpted it, was uh, Bac uh, Bacante, the, the female Bac Bacchus. Uh, but Henry Scripps Booth, who donated her to this location in 1972, did not think that Bacchus was an appropriate figure to have on the Cranbrook campus. And so he renamed her Persephone, the goddess of spring, which I'm... I assume Marshall Fredericks was fine with because he had sold the sculpture, so. And Persephone was placed here. She was not here originally. I do appreciate her location, though, because she has that sort of mirroring of Pan's arrival in the Cranbrook mask. But there was also a need to change this from a family swimming pool to a fountain in 1972. And that was done for safety. So it was a 14 or 12 foot swimming pool for the Booth family. Uh, but as the a state became known more for its schools and institutions having a swimming pool without a fence on a hill was no longer sustainable and so the pool was filled in persephone was added and it became a lovely little garden now i want to walk over and show you the greek gate that is at the entrance to the greek theater the greek theater uh only began being used for graduation ceremonies in 1957 for the Art Academy Honors graduation. In the early years, it was used for classical chamber music concerts, for plays, the Cranbrook Summer Theater Guild. It was also used for St. Dunstan's Theater Guild, um, and then continued on all the way to today with Cranbrook uh, Theater Camps, the Summer Theater it also has had its share of jazz concerts and events. The 1943 American Institute of Architects National Convention was here in the Greek theater. But George Booth worried about having rain. And so he, next to the original Greek gate, which I'm walking down to show us with a beautiful ironwork fence. So you have a, a gate in the Grecian manner, which is becoming ever more Grecian as it sits out here weathering away. Uh, but right next to the gate, George Booth commissioned Albert Kahn to build what he called the garden house. And so we're just right here on Lone Pine Road and you see the garden house um, situated next to Christchurch Cranbrook in the distance. The original Albert Kahn designed lights on each of its corners. But the problem with Albert Kahn's design is that the proportions of it, the roof was far too high. And so its original purpose of providing a uh, rain shelter for events at the Greek theater uh, was negated by the fact that the wind and rain could just come in through the, the sides, as well as it would not fit 500 people, which is what they were uh, attendants at the Greek theater. And so in 1934, Aelio Sarnin enclosed the, uh, the garden house and it became the Cranbrook Pavilion. And in that 1934 conversion, which you can see here, uh, the pavilion became the first Cranbrook Art Museum. So this is where the very first art museums 
uh, or the museum shows that were called Cranbrook Art Museum were held. There were earlier exhibits called the Cranbrook Museum, but that was both science and art. Cranbrook Art Museum dates to that little building. And so we come back here to the Greek theater. Now, just to conclude a little bit of the story of the Cranbrook mask, uh, as the movements move from ancient Greece to medieval Europe to ancient or Elizabethan England and finally 17th century Italy and modern times, uh, Pan and Fool's Gold continue to take us through our journey and eventually at the very end of the Cranbrook mask, we learn that in fact gold is foolish, gold has no uh, ultimate victor, and romance and beauty win out. It's a very 1916 play to have, and it's a very George Booth sort of lesson to teach. The, very, the, the next uh, great performance that was here at the Greek theater, um, I forgot to mention Henry Ford was at the Cranbrook Mask, which is cool historical tidbit. Uh, but one of the next events was a recital of three English uh, singers who performed English folk song and English music. So I'm going to let Chase play us out with another English song. This one from 1916 from Holst. You may know it as Jupiter, but it also is I Vow to Thee, My Country from 1916. Thanks so much for joining us for another Live at Five. I'll be back next Tuesday from another Cranbrook location, and I'll leave you with the last line of the Cranbrook mask. Romance enthroned at the fe uh, feet of God. Romance with eyes of gold and lips of flame. Romance of all things high, most high, most true.